This picture-perfect forest may look pristine, but 70 years ago, it was a very different story. The Clemson Experimental Forest is over 17,000 acres of woodland that has risen like a phoenix from an environmental disaster to a globally interconnected and regionally critical center of biodiversity. The amazing thing here is, this place is surrounded by suburbia. How important is your suburban woodland? I hope you'll join me on today's expedition as we explore this remarkable working forest here at Clemson, where the Blue Ridge yawns its greatness. The Clemson Experimental Forest is 17,500 acres of pastoral habitats and woodland located in the upper Piedmont of South Carolina, nearly surrounding Clemson University. The forest was largely the vision of Dr. George H. All, a Clemson agricultural economist. Back then, in the 1930s, this land looked nothing like it does today. It was mostly spent, highly eroded cotton fields. Through the New Deal programs, largely the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act, the land was acquired, and in 1939, Clemson assumed supervision of the property. The change has been dramatic. Today, it's an obvious green spot, even when viewed from high above. Very different from the landscape where it's nestled. The forest hosts scores of research projects. Approximately 40 university classes use the forest as an outdoor classroom and thousands of residents use the miles of hiking trails, biking routes, horse trails, and enjoy the hunting and fishing opportunities that it provides. South Carolina is experiencing record population growth, and development claims more than 160 square miles of land each year. How important is this place to our natural heritage? Every spring as the forest greens, I'm drawn out into these woods by the flurry of bird activity as migrants return and our favorite residents sing and nest. This is one of my favorite birding spots, and it's literally right here, just outside my back door. Migratory birds aren't the only visitors to these woods in the springtime. Here at Wildcat Creek in the North Clemson Forest, we find one of the most spectacular shows of wildflowers anywhere in the state. We have beautiful plants here at Wildcat Creek that typically we think of finding in cove forests up in the mountains. Plants like Trillium discolor, a beautiful trillium that's endemic to the Savannah River drainage. That means it's found in no other area on earth. Trillium because it has its parts in threes. Three leaves, three sepals, three petals, and this one, a sessile flowered trillium. It doesn't have a clearly defined stalk that differentiates that flower from the leaves. And this one also has that wonderful clove-like scent. Beautiful spicy scent that's really hard to describe, but on warm April days, when you come out here to Wildcat Creek, the whole woods becomes perfumed with the scent of faded trillium. Now, it's only one of three species of trillium that make their home here in the Clemson Forest, and it's only one of two that are found here. Right over here, we have a very different looking plant. This is Trillium Catesbii which is Catesby's trillium, and that one has a clearly defined stalk to the flower. Trillium Catesbii is, is really typical of most mountain woodlands, but extends down into the Piedmont only to about the Clemson Forest. It doesn't go much farther south. And that's one of the special things about the place where we're at. This site, Wildcat Creek in fact, is one of the most diverse wildflower sites you could ever visit in the springtime. This one slope, we came out here and we measured a, out an area 20 meters wide by 50 meters long. That's one tenth hectare. And when we counted the different types of plants that occur in that 20 meter by 50 meter area, we came up with 154 species of plants. That's pretty special. That makes Wildcat Creek the most diverse forest I know of in the eastern United States on that spatial scale. Well, why is it so diverse? That's one of the questions that you have to ask here. This isn't an old growth forest. It's been cut over. It still has well-developed soil but I think the key here lies in the fact that the Clemson Forest straddles the border between Piedmont and mountains. So we have typical Piedmont things like redbud. We have typical mountain things like buffalo nut. 
And at Wildcat Creek, we have that very special geology, amphibolite, that magical rock that when it breaks down, forms those high pH soils. And here at Wildcat Creek, we have a mixture of high calcium, high magnesium, high pH soil, and little areas and pockets of acid soil. And when we get that mixture, you get things that grow on acid soil sites, things that grow on basic soil sites, things that like it in between, and you get no overpowering show of any one species. So here, even though it doesn't look as lush as some other sites that you might find in the mountains, we actually have one of the most tremendous diversities that you'll find in Eastern North America. Many times, the rarest plants aren't necessarily the most beautiful plants. And we've got some really good examples of that right here at Wildcat Creek. This one is a great one to illustrate that point. This is a plant that is usually called leech brush or pirate bush, Nestronia umbellulata. Definitely not the most beautiful flowering bush out here in this forest. It's sort of nondescript with these opposite elliptic entire leaves and little tiny green flowers. But this is a very uncommon plant globally and in South Carolina. This plant is actually what we term a hemiparasite. Now, hemi means partially. This one is usually parasitic on pine trees, and that means that it's pulling some of its nutrients and some of its water from its host plant, from the pine. In this case, it's probably this huge shortleaf pine. It's right up behind us here. This plant goes unnoticed a lot of times in the woods, and it's actually more abundant than we used to think, but it's often overlooked. You can tell it from most plants in the forest by those opposite leaves. One plant that also has opposite leaves that sometimes gets confused with Nestronia is this one that's right here with it. This is sweet shrub. And sweet shrub, again, has opposite elliptic entire leaves. They look very similar to the Nestronia when you compare them side by side. A little darker, but one good key feature for the sweet shrub is that the leaves and pretty much all parts of this plant, when you squish them, and you smell them, they smell a bit like Concord grape. And if it's the spring of the year and this plant is flowering, there's no way in the world you're gonna misidentify that beautiful, very primitive looking lacy flower and all these little strap-like nondescript petals. Either they smell beautiful, they smell like Concord grapes, or sometimes they smell like mm, dead rotting fish or rotten meat. And <laughs> both of those scents apparently are there to attract the primary pollinators of this plant, which in this case are flies. But again, a lot of the rare plants that are here are not the most beautiful plants you see here. Things like the Biltmore's carrion flower and one of my favorites out here, the Senega snake root, Polygola senega. Smallish, whitish colored flowers. You want to see this plant, you come to Wildcat Creek and I promise you, you see lots of rare plants. You see lots of beautiful plants too. And it's just a great example of how important this Clemson Experimental Forest is for preserving the biodiversity of South Carolina. Tracts of undeveloped land, even suburban woodlots, can be extremely important habitat for birds. To explore the importance of the Clemson Forest to bird life, I meet up with my friend and colleague, Dr. Drew Lanham, Clemson University ornithologist and we head out into the forest for a morning filled with birds. Been to Wildcat Creek many a time, but never to look at birds. Usually it's to look at plants, but this time of the morning, there's birds everywhere around us, including what has to be. Oh, unmistakable. Colony. Yep. Jet black wings, <laughs> just, well, scarlet red body, scarlet tanager. Scarlet right? tanager. Um, and just an absolutely gorgeous bird just putting on the full show out here. That bird is, is high up in the tree, and that's where I usually see him. And I usually see him in this habitat. And we're in the interior of a large block of forest here. Yeah, they're forest interior migrants. Birds that depend on, as you said, Patrick, those large, unbroken tracts of forest. And they're pretty sensitive to fragmentation. That is, mm -hmm. breaking up the habitat and kind of isolating it. Right. And so those birds need a lot of space, a lot of elbow room. Or in this case, wing room, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Scarlet tanager also uh, is, a, is a great bird for us to look at here right off the bat because that's a neotropical migrant. Yeah, and, and neotropical migrants really are this whole class of birds that we're concerned about because they really kind of live these, these two disparate lives. Part of their lives they live here in North America breeding, 
Um, but most of their lives they spend down in the tropics. Yeah, northwestern South America this is flying back to, right? Yeah, he's way down there, so I mean that brightly colored bird really fits in with that tropical avifauna. Yeah. But uh, making a tremendous trip back here just probably a couple of weeks ago across the Gulf, braving all of the things that can knock a bird down, this bird is back here doing uh, doing its business. Amazing. The fact that these birds are, are really living two different lives, one here and one in the tropics, makes conservation pretty difficult with these, doesn't it? Yeah, it makes it um, doubly difficult, Patrick, in that, you know, what we have to do here is to try to protect large tracts of forest like this so mm -hmm. that birds like scarlet tanagers have a place to successfully nest. Um, but then we also have to worry about the habitat in between here yeah. and uh, the wintering grounds in the tropics. And we all know what's going on in the tropics. Exactly. And so large blocks of tropical forest also have to be preserved. Now that's a long distance migrant, but I, I got one that I've been watching out of the corner of my eye the uh, whole time we were talking. Take a look right up here uh, and tell me. There? See, they look like a black and white warbler running up the river birch. Yeah. Not a black and white no, warbler, no, right? No, it's not. Look at that black cap on it. Right. It's and a black pole. A black pole warbler. Whoa. Now that takes the scarlet tanager story to the extreme, <laughs> right? Black pole warblers, these birds don't stick around here. Those birds go far to the north, to the actual meeting place of the tundra and the taiga. So way up on the north slope of, yeah. of Canada and Alaska. And that's a bird that migrates up to 8,000 miles, right? From yeah. Alaska to Brazil. I mean, that's, that's incredible to even see that bird here. And you think about the tremendous distance that it's come right. from Brazil here and a good portion of its fall migration, we know at least, is over the ocean. 3,000 miles made without a stop to reach South America, and that's pretty unbelievable. This bird obviously has evolved over a period of time to be able to do this. And that's one of the things I guess they do. They, they bulk up, right, before they leave. Yeah, this hyperphagy, this heightened eating where you just go on this binge, and birds are really good at taking a lot of the stuff that they eat and converting it into this fat. And if you catch one of these birds, you have them in hand, you can softly kind of blow apart the breast feathers. Um, and in migration, you can really kind of tell what condition that bird is in right. based upon the amount of fat that it kind of has sitting in there yeah. um, in its breastbone. Yeah. So really miraculous. That and they're, they're really emaciated when they make it yeah. here. They yeah, have to they feed are. up yeah. really, really good when they get here. That's a, just a neat bird and just a, a super story. No fewer than 36 species of warbler have been spotted using the Clemson Experimental Forest, and at least 15 are known to breed here. Some are on their way to the nearby mountains of the Carolinas, like the black-throated blue, the Canada warbler, and the chestnut-sided. But others are only halfway to their summer home, like the magnolia warbler. This is a bird that likes much scrubbier places than those that we've seen this morning. We're headed to a very different habitat, not quite so pristine, but still very important for bird diversity. Well, we're out of that forest, or partially out. We're sitting here on the edge of the forest, and we've got totally new bird species. And the one that I saw here the other day and still sitting right here, that tree, can you believe that oh, one? Oh, sweet. Must be on territory here. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Baltimore Oriole? Baltimore Oriole, what a beautiful bird. Probably my favorite bird in this area. Look at him, he's just sitting there preening yeah. and singing. Well, yeah, I mean, you hear that song, those those kind of slurred whistles and that yep. chattering. Yeah. That's actually a blackbird. It's related to blackbirds. It's uh, a blackbird? Yeah, it's an icterid. It's a, a very pretty icterid, but. Interesting, I didn't know orioles were blackbirds, but now blackbirds, these guys are frugivores, right? They nectar and fruit. Well, and insects, he's obviously catching insects up there too, but that seems different from blackbird. And orioles are a very diverse group of birds, but they're gonna eat insects and feed insects to their young because they mm -hmm. need that protein. But uh, you know, you could put out orange halves and uh, other kinds of fruit as your feeding station and you can actually right. get those birds in to your yard because most of our yards um, kind of qualify as edge habitat. Yeah, and this is the habitat that, that this bird really loves. This is the forest edge and they, they're, I guess, on the upswing because they love suburban neighborhoods. When I was a kid, I mean, we basically only saw these birds along big rivers, bottomland open cottonwood forests where I used to see yeah. them up in the mountains of yeah. North Carolina. A lot of the birds in here too. It is. Warblers too, hold up, look at, look up there. 
Uh -huh. Right up there. Yeah, a couple warblers. That, oh, hey, that, that, I actually know that warbler. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, the yellow rump warbler, myrtle warbler, right? Yeah, that's the yellow rump. You'll hear birders refer to that bird as a butterbutt. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. which is a good name for it. It's a good name. When he turns around just like that, you can just see the, the yellow on the, on the rear end. Now, what's he doing here? I thought they wintered here. I see them at my feet or even in the wintertime. Yeah, th that bird's kind of late. Um, they'll be pulling out of here pretty soon. They're headed to regions north of here, primarily in coniferous forests. Right. It's a bird that in our state, I haven't been seeing as many of them around during the wintertime, and most of them apparently are on the coast. Is that a cape? Maybe. Ah, so you know your warblers pretty well, Patrick. <laughs> that is Dendroica tigrina. Oh, that's, wow. a, uh, that's a Cape May warbler, okay. and you see that orangish cheek patch on that right. pretty male, right. and the streaking tigrina, yep. the yeah. tiger stripes so there. Cape May warblers certainly don't breed here, right? Those are no, no. far north. Yeah, that bird's heading again to spruce fir forests where um, it makes uh, use of a pretty cyclical resource, spruce budworm, like a, a bunch oh, of other right. warblers do. Right. I know that bird because we get them on campus occasionally, some yeah. springs, but I don't see it every spring. And I'm just wondering, this is the second warbler that's really just transient that we've seen here. Mm -hmm. Saw the black pull now we've seen the Cape May. Are these warblers always on the same route? Do we get the same warblers every year? What's going on there? Well, you know, you largely get the same uh, kind of group of warblers that come through and other migrants, but they might come through in different numbers relative to one another. Uh -huh. um, and sometimes in some years when the weather's really good, these birds push right over us. They're not being right. pushed down by right. bad weather. So that's a really neat bird. And it sort of makes you appreciate how important having these large green spaces in, in the Piedmont of South Carolina, like Clemson Forest, how important they are for even transients. Yeah, it is. I mean, to have that habitat, whether it's edge like this or mature forest like we've already been in, to have that habitat to stop, rest, feed, so yeah. you can continue the next leg of the journey is critically important. Yep. You got one more place to take me? Yeah, but Patrick, it's not going to be quite as pretty as the places <laughs> that we've seen here, but it's going to be real birdie. Cool. The comedian among the warblers has to be the yellow-breasted chat. It's so odd that we're not even really sure that it's a warbler. The strange calls and displays, combined with the yellow breast, give it its common name. Well, Patrick, we're in a place now that it's not much to look at, but it's really important for bird life. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of these scruffy areas in second growth forest and, and early successional community. And what we mean by early successional community is it's a place where the canopy's been removed. And a lot of times we look at these places and we think it's been devastated, but in fact, and this is a place where you find some of the most beautiful birds in North America and in the world. And they're important bird habitats. Well, extraordinarily important because they provide so much structure. Mm -hmm. All of this scrubby stuff that you see here from grasses and forbs down low to shrubs and then a few young trees provide a lot of different levels for bird to exist. Yeah, and we've got birds singing all around us here, even though it's getting a little late in the morning now. But right up here, this has got to be one of my favorites, right up in that little red maple over there. Just beautiful. I guess they've just molted and changed color because it's hard to believe that that American goldfinch is the same goldfinch that comes to my feeder in the wintertime. Well, wild canaries is what people <laughs> right. uh, have called them in the past, but that lemon yellow color and those jet black wings are just exquisite. Yeah. And those birds, a lot of people mistake them in the wintertime for a different species because they're really drably colored. Right, right. And, and they're the only finch I know of that I know of in this area that actually changes color. In the eastern United States, yeah, yeah. they are. The American goldfinches really aren't setting up territories early like other birds are, and that's because they depend on a pretty unique and not exactly attractive food oh, source. Oh, it's pretty to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thistles, right? And actually kind of an attractive species. It's not totally ugly, and, and certainly it attracts some beautiful, beautiful birds. These finches love it. And because it blooms in late spring through summer, I guess these finches delay their breeding to correspond with when food's available. Yeah, when food's available, but they also take that down and they use that in the nests. Yep. And so it makes a nice, soft, cushy nest for the young and they're getting a food resource out of it yeah, too. So a very cool bird and a very cool plant that, yeah, you might pull it up, but if you want to keep those beautiful goldfinches around, you need to keep a few thistles around in the neighborhood too. Patrick, hold on, right up here. This is the bird that I cut my teeth on. That buzzy little song up there on that uh -huh. branch, it's kind of out of place, but oh. it's a, that's a prairie warbler. That tree's in the middle of all of this stuff. Right, right. And so that bird is just taking advantage 
of uh, caterpillars and other insects on that fresh green foliage. But again, um, that bird is probably going to make a territory and hopefully a nest right. somewhere in this scrubby early successional habitat. That bird is actually one that is currently in decline. It is, along with quite a few other early successional birds, birds that depend on this habitat that we're standing in the middle of. Prairie warblers, yellow-breasted shats, uh, birds like that that need these ephemeral habitats. These... Ephemeral means short-term or short-lived. They, yeah. They're not here forever. Yeah, I mean, you know, when a forest disappears, whether because man cuts it down or whether a storm comes in and takes it out, yeah. you have a few years where that habitat is really suitable for something like a prairie warbler or a chat. So you need grass seeds and you need scruffy areas. So keeping a little bit of this early successional community in your neighborhood is essential if you want some of the most beautiful birds in North America to be among the birds that visit your backyard. Absolutely. Well, I've got uh, a songbird of my own I'd like to show you. Uh, right. Something that lives in a little moister habitat. So let's take a look. Go take a look at that. It's a nice big water snake taken off there, isn't it? Yeah, found the perfect sunny spot. Yeah, but check this out, Drew. <laughs> I lied to you. They're not really songbirds, but I sort of consider these to be the warblers <laughs> of the stream. Those are just indescribable, aren't they? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out which crayon out of my box of 64 I would label these fish with. This is absolutely incredible. What are they doing here? Well, this is a breeding aggregation of yellowfin shiners. And uh, even though we call them yellowfin shiners, here in the upper Savannah River drainage, they have orange fins. And a beautiful little kind of smoky bluish white mask on the face. And it's, it's just one of the most beautiful shiners that exist anywhere. And, and they're actually probably the most common shiner here in the upper small tributaries of the Savannah River. Natropus ludipinus, even the scientific name means yellow fin. And uh, these guys, the brightly colored ones, are all males. And you'll notice they're all clumped around this little pile of stones. And that pile of stones is a nest. Just like cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests, these guys are actually laying their eggs on the nest of another fish. In this case, it's the bluehead chub, which is a, a very common, large, minnow-like fish that lives here in these streams. And the chub actually builds that nest. These fish are attracted to that nest and spawn over top of the nest. And the chub itself will provide protection for the nest because it patrols this area and will keep predators away from the nest. So it actually protects the eggs of these shiners. Now, unlike cuckoos and cowbirds, they're not going to push out the chub's eggs out of that right. nest. They're, just uh, in there breeding on top of the, the chub's nest. They're not gonna harm the chub. They're not gonna harm the chub's eggs at all. So it's just amazing. These guys will color up like this only for a few days, a few hours. And you have to be out here this time of year, late April through May, really to see this. And you have to be here at just the right time um, to catch these guys. But man, when they're fired up, it's really something else, isn't it? It's like fire in the water. It really is. Absolutely beautiful. We'll let them continue spawning, but that's really one of the true miracles that you find out here in the streams in the Clemson Forest. Thanks for showing it. Yeah. One of the great things about the Clemson Forest is that it's not very far away. It's right at the border of the university, close enough that we can become intimately familiar with its resources. It's a place you can take the time to enjoy day after day. Well, my graduate student, Matt Johnson, found something pretty cool right here yesterday, which he instructed me I had to look at. When he turned over this rock, he found something that's still there, a big mass of eggs. And if you look at these eggs up close, pour a little water on them, keep them wet, and you'll notice that they're moving. Well, these are eggs of a very large salamander, one of the most aquatic of the lungless salamanders that we have, the black-bellied salamander. It's Desmognathus quadrimaculatus. That's a salamander that I usually think of being up high in the mountains. But Clemson Experimental Forest is located right there at the transition between the Piedmont and the mountains. So we get species like black-bellied salamanders, Metcalf salamanders, Ocoee salamanders, seal salamanders, all those things that we think of as being in the Blue Ridge, we get them down here in the upper Piedmont. Many of them are right at their extreme southern limit. The Jordans or Metcalf salamander is at not only its southern limit, but also its elevational limit, down below 600 feet here. 
So it's just incredible. These mountain things are able to make a living here. Really, where their range peters out, the ends of the range and at the edge of their tolerance. So a very neat salamander, and it's one of the reasons why this experimental forest is so important. We have many, many miles of headwaters that are preserved here. And each one of these headwater streams here in the North Forest supports populations of salamanders at the very limit of the range. And those species at the limit of the range are oftentimes the most important ones for dealing with changes in the climate and dealing with creation of new species, speciation. So yet another reason why this Clemson experiment on the forest is so important. Miles and miles of neat, clean headwaters. In total, over 200 miles of streams are found in the Clemson Forest. The streams, like the forest, have seen changes, declining with the near loss of the forest in the early 20th century, and now thriving again. Even some long-gone residents, like the turquoise daughter, are making a comeback, thanks to a helping hand from Clemson researchers. Change has always been a part of the forest. Join me next time as we continue to explore a changing landscape in the jewel of the Upper Piedmont, the Clemson Forest. We often take pastoral land and forests for granted. That is, until they start to disappear. But how important are forests? And I mean just forests. I'm not talking about forests with towering mountains or cascades of waterfalls, just plain old woodlots, even suburban forests. How important are these places to our natural heritage? Well, the Clemson Forest is one of these places, and I have to admit that I didn't know much about it until just a couple years ago. But now, I drive through this forest every day on my way to work, and I'm constantly amazed at the things that I find here. Join me on today's expedition as we explore this land of change and a forest that's full of surprises. Change is the one part of nature that you can depend upon. And change has operated dramatically in the Clemson Experimental Forest. The forest is 17,500 acres of working woodland and pastoral land acquired during the New Deal, largely through the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act. This region was decimated, worn out, and heavily eroded farmland. But you'd never know it by driving through the forest today. It looks natural, and it looks recovered, but the scars of poor land use remain. To get a very rare glimpse into the Piedmont before European colonization, you can visit the all-natural area. This natural area is named for the man who led the charge to acquire and protect the Clemson Forest, George H. All. I meet plant ecologist Vic Shelburne, and we start down the trail. Along the way, Vic points out that even though this looks like a natural forest, we're actually standing on the remnants of an old cotton field. The topsoil was lost, so today, we're left with only a shallow organic layer and that brick-hard red clay, the subsoil, that we're all so familiar with here in the Piedmont. But just a short ways down the trail, everything changes. Well, look at this, Patrick. Quite a difference, don't you think? That's absolutely amazing. And we've gone from a site that was just young pines and a few hardwoods coming up underneath to a site that are these gigantic <laughs> trees, and it's, they're not all the same age. It's a mixed age right. stand, so we've got some huge red oaks and white oaks and beech in here, and then smaller ones too. It's a mixed right. age stand, uneven right. so age. It's all different age classes. This is a, a Piedmont relic, really, in a yeah. sense. That, and there's two factors here which are making this site very unique. First, it's a north-facing slope. And of course, what happens when you're north-facing, you're cooler yeah, and The sun's moister. not shining right. right on the slope all the right. time. So decomposition, slower, slower, you get more buildup of organics, and you're exactly. not losing as much water. Right, right. And we know we've cored these trees, and they're about 200 years old, which means wow. probably late 1700s it was cut. 
if and it then was cut. If it yes. was cut, we're fairly certain because most of the area was cut at least once. Dying to see the soil and see what an original Piedmont soil yeah, that's, looks we'll like. See. That's our next stop. Great. <laughs> Now this is one of my favorite things about living here in this part of South Carolina and being able to enjoy the Clemson Forest. This time in the spring, we get flowers on our painted buckeyes. And what color are the flowers on painted buckeyes? Normally pink around here. Pink around here, that's right, but this is special. Normally, painted buckeye flowers are green. And a lot of people look at these pink flowers and they'll use the North Carolina wildflower book and they'll say, oh, they're reddish pink, hmm. they must be red buckeye. And they think this right. is the true red buckeye, which is Aeschylus pavia. It's not, this is Aeschylus sylvatica, but it has a little bit of pavia in it. This is an example where because red buckeye has those red tubular flowers, right. it's pollinated by Hummingbirds. Absolutely, red tubular flowers attract hummingbirds. These things flower in the spring when ruby-throated hummingbirds are migrating. They'll feed on the red buckeye down in the low country, and as they come up the Savannah River drainage migrating, they feed on sylvatica. They still have pollen from the red buckeye on their bill. Oh, really? Okay. This thing gets cross-pollinated, and what's happened here in the Blue Ridge Escarpment region in the upper Piedmont of South Carolina is we've incorporated a few genes from the red buckeye, just an all around neat species, the painted buckeye. This is one of the true gems of the Clemson Forest. Well, Patrick, I told you a little bit of a lie. I said this area hadn't been disturbed at all, but actually about 25 years ago, we created a nice big soil pit here so that we could show people. And because it's north facing, it's steep and it wasn't cut, we have a really beautiful soil profile to show you here. Right. And it's obvious here that if you just grab hold of some of this topsoil here. Oh, yeah, it's, it's something that we all wish we had in the garden. I mean, my gosh. brown, coarse, friable fluffy, soil. Easy for roots to penetrate. And you can see the roots have definitely taken advantage of this situation. So we lost how much soil wow. with agriculture here in this At part of the state? At least a foot in this particular situation. Now, it's probably anywhere from six to 12 inches of soil that we lost. It's down in the ocean now, yeah. long gone and not, you can't get it back except by the long-term process of soil building. So here we have a foot, two feet of, of topsoil of a yeah. horizon. So we're talking right. about a thousand years per inch. Yeah, and it's got a long way to wait. <laughs> that's a long way to wait till we get back to this. Yeah, very rich soil. There's a ton of downed wood in these older growth forests, and I guess that's typical, isn't it? Right, we just saw that huge log up above there, and yep. that had fallen, and it's very typical because all trees do die sooner or later, and in an old growth forest like this, you get a lot of coarse woody debris on the ground. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And of course, we have huge living trees as well, uh, and the monarch of all these in here has got to be the, the American beech. Exactly. Very shade tolerant, needs the shade of other trees to grow well, and this one's been here a long time. Yeah, sort that's... Of proving that this has been here undisturbed for many, many years. I mean, this is one of the slowest growing trees we that's have. Right. And right. to get a tree this size, I don't even want to guess how old. No. This <laughs> giant old beech is. But what amazes me about beech trees is no matter how far yeah. away from a trail or out in the wilderness a beech tree is, eventually, Somebody's going to carve their That's name right, on the side it of it. And, and it stays there a long time because the bark is very slow growing. So whoever TR and JGR, I hope they're having we a hope they're having a good They probably time had still. their 50th wedding anniversary by now. <laughs> easily, <laughs> easily. That. But uh, you know, this, these wonderful soil conditions, this high pH soil has, has allowed us to develop one of the nicest shows of wildflowers mm -hmm. that you find anywhere in the Piedmont. And there are May apples here, right. lots of May apples in full flower right now in, in middle April and, and trillium, one of the, the neat trillium that come down into the Piedmont here, you have to look underneath the leaves of that trillium to find the flower. This beautiful white flower with the deep maroon stamens is southern nodding trillium. And even the phlox here. We have this beautiful yeah, blue phlox that's actually very rare in South Carolina. Phlox stolonifera creeping along. This is a common name, I guess, is trailing phlox. It's an amazing place and all year long we'll see a procession of wildflowers from these early spring species right on through summer and right into fall. Yeah one thing after another that makes this one of the greatest natural areas that I know of in this part of the state and one of the real gems. Right. It's a Clemson Heritage Trust State. area and a Society of American Foresters natural area also. Fantastic. So it's a great place to come and visit. The all natural area 
is only one of the many surprises that you can find here in the South Clemson Forest. I drive through this forest every day on my way to work, and one of my favorite stops is along 18 Mile Creek, home to some of the most incredible wetlands that I know of anywhere in the Piedmont. As we move up the 18 Mile Creek drainage here in the South Forest, we enter an area that's absolutely littered with large and just majestic wetlands. Most of these are beaver ponds. They're natural wetlands, but they're created by a creature. They're created, in this case, by a beaver, of course. And when you look out here on this beautiful expanse of wetland, you notice there's lots of duck boxes here. This is a great site uh, for wood ducks. You come here pretty much any time of the year, you're guaranteed to see wood ducks. And as I was walking up here, I just spooked out a female and five or six chicks that came right off the bank here. And the neatest thing of all, these old rotten logs that hang out over top of this water provide home for prothonotory warblers, but they're also providing a nesting cavity for tree swallows. And tree swallows are one of the most beautiful birds that we have in the upstate of South Carolina. And a bird that was only first reported breeding here just a couple years ago. And today, we're finding them breeding throughout this part of the Clemson Forest almost always on old dead snags that hang out over top of the water in that beautiful violet green iridescent back and a clean, clear white throat and belly are great distinguishing marks for that species. It's one of four swallows that we see here uh, this time of year. Cliff swallows, rough wing swallows, which are actually sitting right up on the stick out in front of me here, that breed in banks, cliff swallows and barn swallows, the four swallows that we have commonly here in the Clemson Forest. Just amazing to me that all of this time that I've been working at Clemson University, I never knew that a site as spectacular and diverse as the South Clemson Forest was sitting less than two miles from where I live. The wetlands are full of life this time of year. But May is also a busy time for our slithering friends. And this is one of the great things about being out in the woods in the springtime. It's not just great for birds, it's a fantastic time of year to see reptiles. When the temperatures out here get up into the upper 70s, low 80s in May, just a fantastic time to catch snakes like this out basking and actually can get up pretty close to them. This guy here is one of the most common snakes in South Carolina and it's a rat snake, but we call it a corn snake. The corn snake, just like all rat snakes, specializes in eating mammals, rodents. So it's very beneficial to us, and it's harmless. It's non-venomous. I'll try to show you why he's called a corn snake, but uh, I think you're gonna find out real quick why this snake uh, in the wild state is not quite as nice as the ones <laughs> we keep in captivity. You see him rattling his tail there. That means he's getting a little bit mad at me, and he's likely to bite me. Let's see if we can get him up here without biting me. Oh, you're a good snake, aren't you? Take a look at his belly. The belly of the snake is patterned with these little flecks and uh, apparently it reminded people of Indian corn. And from Indian corn, we probably get the name corn snake. It's a beautiful snake and one of 19 species that's found here in the Clemson Forest. And it, it's a good example of a, of a widespread species, but we have snakes that are found mostly in the coastal plain, but sometimes found up here in the Clemson Forest region, really at the edge of the range, and some that are right at the southern edge of the range. They don't make it any farther downstate than they than right here in the Clemson Forest. So it's really a meeting place. If snakes are more common in the coast, and more common up here. And we'll let you get back to your business. The beaver ponds and wetlands here are great places to see wildlife you'd never think would be here, or maybe never even knew existed, like the swamp rabbit. This is a semi-aquatic and very shy rabbit. They're only known from this corner of the state in South Carolina. You might not expect a place this far inland to be great for shorebirds. But during migration, leaf sandpipers, semi-palmated plovers, and the widespread spotted sandpipers are always at hand. These three are well documented from the forest. But this spring, a drought year, there's plenty of birds that aren't even on the official list. If you want to keep banker's hours, and still do some bird watching, one of your best bets is to look at shorebirds. These guys keep pretty civilized hours. You don't look for them out here singing in the morning. You look for them when they're out here foraging. 
So especially during migration, first couple weeks in May, you can come out here right in the middle of the day to my favorite spot to see shorebirds, which is this wonderful large marsh that's exposed when Lake Hartwell's down on 18 Mile Creek. And right up here in this little pool, we have just an amazing assortment of some of the most beautiful shorebirds that we find coming through this area. So we've got greater yellow legs and lesser yellow legs up there, and also the one solitary sandpiper. You're wondering how it gets that name? There's one of them out there. We've got four yellow legs, greater yellow legs, one lesser yellow leg, and one solitary sandpiper. Right now, they're coming out of the grass and starting to forage. Um, when we first got here, uh, they were bobbing their heads up and down. And when these birds bob their heads up and down, they're really uh, nervous. They know you're watching them. This is a perfect opportunity to see the difference between the greater yellow legs and the lesser yellow legs, because right now, they're standing right side by side. That lesser yellow legs is really out there consuming insects, especially aquatic insect larvae, and we can't really see what he's eating. He's still a little too far away to see what he's grabbing, but those greater yellow legs, I've been sitting here watching them, seeing something absolutely amazing. These guys are gorging themselves on tadpoles. Look at this guy going right after big tadpole, trying to stuff it down and, and getting it down. <laughs> That's something amazing because I haven't even seen that listed in the literature as being a major part of their diet. But this year, we've had a little bit of rain in the spring. It's filled up these temporary ponds, provided a perfect place for those frogs to breed, and there's just an abundance of tadpoles here, and that may be why they've stayed here so long. That's really what I love about shorebirds. Super long distance migrants. They may come from South Florida, Central America, South America, all the way up into North Carolina, South Carolina, and then continue all the way up to Canada. And they may only spend a few weeks on the wintering ground, a few weeks in the breeding ground, and really, just as much time here. And I think we often underestimate how important these little stopovers are. It's kind of interesting here because all three of these species that we're seeing out here are really birds that are not on the official list of species known from the Clemson Forest. So we've added three species just today right here. Let's see how close we can get to them and see what else might be lying in this little remnant pond. That nervous bobbing that the yellow legs do is one of the best ways to identify that bird, and they are very skittish. So they flew off as soon as I got close to this pond, but there's a lot else out here moving around, and this is a perfect time to come visit these ponds in the marsh. A lot of dragonflies, you have blue dashers, great big pond hawks, and beautiful white tails out here. But I saw this guy actually from back there moving around in the mud, and I think that's why, where they get their common name for this turtle. This is the Eastern Mud Turtle. And it's one of the cutest little turtles. It's not a flashy turtle. It's not as brilliantly colored as the Southern Painted Turtle that we just saw here in this pond also. Then it doesn't spend a lot of time basking and it doesn't spend a lot of time up floating on the surface. This turtle spends his days walking around under the water foraging for basically anything he can catch. There's a lot of food in here for eastern mud turtles, and it's, it's one of probably eight species of turtle that's found here. You know, turtles are fascinating, and mud turtle just as fascinating as any others, because these are the only animals that I know of where the actual pelvis and the shoulder blades are actually inside of the rib cage. If we look at a, at a dead shell of a box turtle or even a mud turtle, we'll notice that the backbone is held right here along the base of the carapace of the shell. And the carapace itself, the top part of the shell, that's the rib cage. The ribs have been modified outward and all those parts that we have on the outside of our rib cage have been moved and tucked inside so this guy can carry his home around with him and ball up into it because he doesn't have much else to defend himself against predators. So we'll let this guy go and it's just amazing how fast they bury back down underneath that mud. And by the way, if you're wondering how they breathe when they're under that mud, they do it through their back end. They actually do something called cloacal pumping where they'll draw water in and out of the, their backside and actually exchange oxygen there. So it's almost like having gills, but in a slightly more disgusting manner. A ton of lake bottom has already been exposed and transformed into wetland. But as the season progresses, severe drought sets in, and the wetlands dry out completely. 
When you have extreme drought years like this one and Lake Hartwell dries way down, it exposes that lake bottom that's all mucky and wet still and you get a wonderland of wildflowers. Well, a wonderland of weeds like all these smart weeds that I'm surrounded by here. It's, it's just incredible. I've seen at least five species of smart weed right here. Uh, but two main species here of smartweed or knotweed in the genus Polygonum and it just creates a beautiful showcase of flowers in the late summer early fall and in large part this is why there's so many waterfowl here at 18 Mile Creek. Lots of plant diversity during dry years and when they die and this area gets flooded again it floods up all those seeds perfect food for waterfowl. All the insects are feeding here perfect food for other songbirds even the shorebirds that we have here. Even in dry years, the Clemson Forest is a wonderland. There's almost no water left in 18 Mile Creek, but I saw one of the coolest animals right here. Just saw his head and his snorkel sticking up out of the sand. I'll see if I can dig around in here and find him because he's really one of the neatest animals that we have, <laughs> look at that, in the Carolinas, hidden out under the sand and perfectly blended to match the sand. Goodness gracious. Probably a newborn of this year, uh, soft shell turtle. This is a spiny soft shell turtle. And uh, we call them soft shell turtles because the shell itself is soft. Soft shells are the only turtles that we have in fresh water in the Carolinas that have a shell that's soft and pliable. He is colored just like a male spiny soft shell. And when you feel the back of the shell of a male spiny soft shell, you understand why they're called spiny. The back of the shell is covered uh, with little projections that make it feel rough, just like sandpaper. Spiny soft shells are uniquely adapted to living in aquatic environments. He's got these really short, strong forearms and back legs and his feet entirely webbed perfect for moving through the water. Another adaptation this guy has is the snorkel on the end of his nose. This long snorkel allows him to stay underwater and only stick that snorkel up to breathe so he don't, never has to really leave the water and in fact he can sit down here camouflaged in the sand and just stick that snorkel up out of the out of the sand out of the water and just sit there and wait for something to come along to eat. And one of the most unique bizarre and unusual reptiles we have in South Carolina. Maintaining a healthy forest doesn't just mean preserving the property itself. You also have to preserve ecosystem function. When Europeans first encountered these woodlands, they encountered a very different looking place. It's because they burned. Now that process of burning was really removed from most of the Piedmont in upstate of South Carolina a little over a hundred years ago. Um, the advent of agriculture and the beginning of fire suppression. But here on the Clemson Forest, we're reintroducing and maintaining our woodlands with just those processes. So here, this site is getting ready to go through a massive transformation today. We're gonna light the world on fire. Twenty-four hours after the burn and while it's still smoking, the place, it looks devastated. It looks like most of the woody plants that are wilted or burn up. But what we're about to see here is not death and devastation, it's rebirth. This habitat here is just amazing in the fall, following a fire. You come out here and you see just a field full of native grasses, things you see in tall grass prairie, and just a beautiful display of fall flowering wildflowers. These plants in this natural community would not be possible to be here without fire. Turns out that early naturalists and early land surveyors, people like William Bartram and John Lawson, who traveled through the Piedmont of the Carolinas, tell us that the Piedmont landscape has changed dramatically since their visits. They describe a landscape of widely spaced trees and barren hilltops. They were really covered with habitat that was very prairie-like, or like savannas that we have in the coastal plain today. 
This habitat type is all but extinct in the Carolinas today. Only tiny fragments on roadsides and in power lines and places like this exist. And when you think about flowers that bloom in the fall, native flowers, you probably think about asters. And we have a lot of asters here. But there's one aster here, and to me it's the most beautiful aster in the Carolinas. It's really found in this habitat and nowhere else on Earth. It's right over here, and I think you're gonna love it. Well, this is it. The Georgia aster, Symphiotricum georgianum. What a beautiful plant. Those deep, dark, purple, petal-like flowers around the outside of this inflorescence, group of flowers, help to distinguish it. I said a group of flowers. It looks like I'm holding one flower in my hand, but in fact, I'm holding many, many flowers. In the aster family, things like daisies, asters, goldenrod, what appears to be one flower is actually a collection of many. It's a composite. So when you play that old childhood game of picking off these petals and saying, she loves me, she loves me not, you're picking off entire flowers. These flowers around the outside of an aster are actually called ray flowers. In the center, we have this collection of smaller five-petaled flowers that are called disc flowers. One of our largest flowering asters and, and one of the latest flowering asters that we have in South Carolina. This one doesn't start flowering until late October, sometimes even early November. Because it flowers so late, it's pollinated mostly by bumblebees, carpenter bees. And every so often we'll see one visiting a flower. And if you come out here early in the morning when it's really cool in the fall, you'll actually see bumblebees looking like they're asleep on the flower. Bumblebees are active at lower temperatures than most of our other bee species, so they're perfect pollinators for things that live at high elevations or flower early in the spring or late in the fall like Georgia aster. We have some of the largest populations in the world of this plant, and it's probably one of the places where this plant has its, its greatest stronghold. It's considered rare in each state it occurs in, and it's limited to the Piedmont, and today it's even considered what we call a candidate for federal listing. So a symbol of times past and a plant that's not doing very well today, but doing well where we have good management practices like this. It's a beautiful plant and you just wait all year to see these masses in flower here in the Clemson Experimental Forest. In any season, the Clemson Experimental Forest is a treasure trove of beauty and diversity. Diversity of habitats, but also a diversity of life. Large tracts of forest and traditional use lands are a critical part of maintaining our natural heritage. But understanding that change is a part of these systems is also crucial for managing them. If you ever get a chance to visit this area, I invite you to check out the Clemson Experimental Forest and explore the treasures that are hidden right in plain sight. I'm Patrick McMillan, wishing you your own exciting expedition.